So this is Richard Socher, Richard Socher, and he needs an introduction. Uh, he, his early work at Princeton and Stanford laid the foundation for all the AI language applications we see today, like smart search engines and GPT-3 and all this stuff. So Richard was the first scientist after the so-called AI winter for many decades, who applied neural networks and deep learning to natural language processing successfully. And today is one of the most cited young AI re researchers on this planet. He founded a startup, which was later acquired by Salesforce. He became a Salesforce chief scientist with less than a thousand researchers working for him. And in 2020, he left Salesforce to found another startup you mentioned before, U.com which is the thing at the moment. You just mentioned in the last three weeks have been crazy being in the New York Times, people handing over their money and beg you to be an investor now and stuff like that. So welcome, Richard. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. So you were really the first person. There are one or two other scientific papers in, in 214 or in that, in that space. But you have been the first person in Princeton, Stanford, Stanford, Stanford sorry, um, to, to work on this, to, to apply um, neural networks to natural language. And how did your colleagues react at the time? Yeah, so when I was a PhD student, I was very fortunate to be at Stanford at the time and knowing a lot about natural language processing and then seeing deep learning taking off in computer vision, learning features, having AI kind of just give a lot of training data with ImageNet, which is a very large data set, and then, actually, which you know, I'm also one of the co-authors of, and seeing how the AI will learn everything in between from raw pixels to is there a cat or dog in the image, and just AI kind of understanding the visual world. And I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we also could use those ideas for natural language processing? And at the time, it was a very controversial idea to think of words as vectors, just lists of numbers. And sentences, everything is just a list of number. And once it's a list of number, a neural network can very easily make sense of it, predict it, and uh, understand the sentiment, translate sentences, and so on. And I literally had some very famous professors in the field kind of scream at me with their heads red, saying how little sense it will ever make to map a sentence into a vector. And I just was a little bit stubborn, and I was like, I think we can make it work. When did you first realize that you were finally right? Yeah, it's, it's great to be right. So the, the whole sphere of AI just moved in your direction. When did you realize? It honestly took a while, and uh, it was kind of brutal, because in the beginning, and there's some parallels uh, in the last couple of years with U.com too, but in the beginning, like my papers actually got rejected. Uh, we we're just a little bit better than the state of the art in sentiment analysis and, and various other NLP tasks. And people are like, oh, but I already have my features. Why do I need to you know, care about this thing has learned? And the truth is that when you change a field like that, there are a lot of uh, people who know that their citation counts will stop growing, mm. and they don't like the fact that they're getting replaced uh, in their linguistic knowledge, for instance, and feature engineering knowledge with, with an algorithm. Mm. Mm. We see this now also with generative AI. Like, illustrators don't like that AI can now generate illustrations in the, a similar style. I think the defining moment has been in December when uh, GPT-3 and, uh, uh, well, their, their chat client went public, everyone could use it. I'm using it to prepare this, so I asked the AI to just ask the question, and it's perfect. It's, it's wonderful to do that. Um, are you still surprised about these developments? Is it just, oh, yo, I knew that already, or is it like, it's cool? How does, does it feel for you as the guy who invented all this? So I didn't invent yeah, all yeah, of it, yeah, yeah, sorry, um, sorry, just, sorry. you know, a bunch of parts of it. Um, yeah. But uh, it's still amazing. It's, it's incredible what generative AI has been able to do. You know, it can now uh, generate and write code for you as a programmer. If you're a marketer or someone who has to generate and write text, it will help you write text for you. If you're a visual artist, it will help you create images. And we have all these features on you.com so that people can actually find them very easily. And similar to the early days of deep learning, when we started in search engine two years ago, thinking we can use deep learning to really change how people search, how people find information, how they learn, how they navigate uh, the internet, people thought we were crazy. <laughs> like we're, people thought it was crazy to use neural networks for NLP. 
And uh, now in the last several weeks, literally since December when we launched UChat, the sentiment has shifted and it feels like that second moment in my life and I'm fortunate uh, to again have been sort of prepared and hence uh, be able to get lucky uh, to be in the right place with the right technology at the right time. I remember the moment when I heard what we were doing to 2020 somewhere and I was like, really a search engine? <laughs> so I think everyone was like, what is he doing there? Why is that visionary at all? And this is something, so obviously you, you, you publish your uh, Udacom chat client uh, right after GPT-3 and it's basically the same thing with well, you're doing some things differently. There's a secret source. You're alive already, so you, there's no lag between the world and the informational world and the U.com index. I don't know if that's the correct way to say that. Can you describe what you're doing differently than all the other uh, engines? Yeah, so maybe for everyone who is not familiar with, with all this craziness in chat, uh, though I'm sure most of you are, uh, the idea is that basically you have large language models. It's a very large neural network that can predict and is trained to predict the next word. It's a very simple idea. You take a large text and you every time you try to predict the next word. Technically, it's the next sequence of characters, but you know, let's think of them as words for now. Uh, and what that means is that that model learns about the world. And, and you think, why could it learn about geography, for instance? You're just predicting the next word. Well, imagine you're reading a Wikipedia article or reading a message and someone says, oh, I'm in New York and I'm driving north too. Now, in order to predict the next word, you need to know geography. And well, once it made a mistake, you learn, no, it is actually Boston. Now you know, oh, Boston is north of New York. And in order to predict that the next word, it turns out you learn a lot of things about the world. And if you can now ask the model, oh, how should I program this? Or like, what would be a good strategy for my company? And all of these different questions, uh, these models can predict them better and better. And so, so that's, that's what also a, a large language model that we've launched. We're unfortunately not sharing all the details of how we're exactly doing it. But the biggest difference uh, to ChatGPT is that uh, UChat actually has access to the internet. It will surf the internet for you, find recent information, and then whenever possible, give you citations for the facts that it's pulling out from the internet. And so it's an even more uh, helpful partner in identifying and learning about the world. So the Googlers, Google is officially totally relaxed. And I had the pleasure to talk to a high-ranking uh, board member just recently. They are like, oh, we have all this, no problem for us. But it's not there. They didn't dare to publish this. Is this a Google killer, the conversational interface? It certainly feels a lot more obvious now to people that uh, there are um, there is a possibility to compete with Google. Uh, two years ago, people thought it was absolutely insane and impossible. Uh, but uh, we've seen last year actually multiple waves, people thinking Reddit could replace Google, TikTok is the new Google for young folks, now ChatGPT. And the truth is that none of those three technologies by themselves could fully beat Google, but it's clear that people are looking for an alternative because Google has gotten pretty bad. And in the case of ChatGPT, a big limitation was that it didn't have citations and it didn't cite the web, uh, but we already fixed that and we're gonna do even more of that in the future. And you could say, well, Google in theory has, they literally invented transformer models, which are sort of one of the baseline uh, components of large language models. Uh, but the pr in practice, I think they're stuck in a very clear innovator's dilemma. It's, it's almost classic. I think books will be written about it and it's like yet another example, right? If you show five ads in the beginning of your page and someone comes in and say, hey, how about we replace three of those ads or four of those ads with this amazing AI that just answers my question and it's super helpful. Well, they would have to fire 70,000 people uh, if they lose, you know, 30%, 50% of their uh, ad revenue. And so they're stuck in this innovator's dilemma uh, of not really wanting to be the most helpful answering and, and sort of do engine that they could be. And, and that's the opportunity for us as a small startup. I do have a question for this super bright audience here. And can you yell the answer? It's a number. Can you yell the answer as quickly as possible? Three women are in a room. Two of them are mothers who have just given birth. Their babies are also in the room. Now the children's fathers come in. What is the total number of people in the room? <laughs> I hear five. 
So the answer is five. The audience is like five. <laughs> it's seven. So, sorry for that. So, you, so I pregnant call, woman had babies. <laughs> I call this the Socher test because normally AIs get it wrong. So you told me this this question. If you want to know if a chatbot is a real person or a chatbot, um, you ask this question. Every AI on this planet. Get it, gets it wrong all the time. I tried it with you.com, it answered six, which is a little better, the correct answer is seven, a little better than this audience. Uh, <laughs> um, so there's this interesting gap between, well, if I tell JetGBT, hey, can you rewrite Shakespeare in a William Gibson style? It's perfect. But I, if I ask simple question like these, the models are like hallucinating is the word, I think. Mm -hmm. um, so, so how can you fix this? You are in the middle of the process fixing this, right? We, we are actually fixing it. A lot of people say, oh, because this model is currently making this mistake, it cannot be used for X. And the truth is that in a few weeks, we'll, we'll have fixed a lot of those kinds of problems. It is also interesting when you think about intelligence, a lot of people want to think of into artificial intelligence to have to be quite similar to human intelligence, but you can have a very different way of doing it. And I think the answer, which is kind of surprising, like that these models, they're having 175 billion parameters, right? And they're doing tons of matrix multiplications, but they can't give you the answer for what's 165 divided by 36.7. Like these simple kinds of multiplication and divisions, they cannot yet do. But what they can do is they can write programs too, right? I mentioned they can generate, you know, these models can generate code and program for you and generate text. So you can actually give them access to a Python interpreter and a programming environment and then just have them program the answer and then they will solve also all those kinds of problems. And that will be a very different kind of intelligence than what we, you know, how we think of human intelligence. The system need the information of the world to get trained, right? And I think you said several times that there will be a threshold so if we index everything we have, then they can't learn anything anymore. So are we in that space already or? I think we're getting closer, you know, once you have trillions of parameters in your language model, you need to also have a ton of training data to actually still make use of all those parameters. And I think at some point these models will have read anything and everything they can on the internet. And at that point, you need to have different kinds of objective functions and maybe different kinds of data sets to continue training them in a useful way. Mm. I suggested the title of this, this talk, uh, Will Machines Think?, which is a silly question. Um, will machines think, uh, Richard, one day? And what does it even mean? Um, and how can we achieve it? Yeah, thinking is certainly related uh, to intelligence uh, and, you know, artificial intelligence we define in various ways. Very often it's very human centric, right? We think of motor intelligence and that's the field of robotics. We think of computer vision and that's visual intelligence, understanding the world and there's sort of the field of computer vision. Um, and then there's, of course, what I think is the most interesting manifestation of human intelligence, which is language and natural language understanding and sort of NLP natural language processing uh, is mapping into that. And then there's kind of an interesting question. If a model behaves in a sort of behavioral sort of definitions of intelligence and philosophers also disagree on, on the de various definitions here, but if you act as if you're intelligent, maybe that also means that you're intelligent enough to be able to act uh, in that way. Mm. Will there be something, I think the technical term is, or the, the expert's term, artificial general intelligence one day. So, an entity that is able to understand the world, maybe talk to me, and which is not um, focused on one application like predicting the best William Gibson style um, Shakespeare. So like understanding everything. Will, will we reach that, that uh, layer in AI one day? I think there's no question in my mind that we will reach it one day. Um, I think even experts disagree on when we're actually going to get this you know, elusive AGI, the super intelligence that will solve any task that human can solve. And uh, there are different definitions also. Uh, one definition is it might have to capture 50% of all human jobs and be able to basically automate uh, said jobs uh, in a complete fashion. And if it, you know, sort of automates 50% of human economic activity, then maybe we can define it as artificially, generally intelligent. Um, I think, again, often the definitions of trying to def 
define the definition of intelligence purely on human intelligence is already limiting, and I think in some ways uh, a lack of imagination and creativity. So for instance, these large language models I described that predict the next word can also predict the next amino acid in a sequence of proteins, and then can actually sample and generate new proteins, which is another research project we had done back in my Salesforce days. And then we actually, in wet labs, synthesized those proteins, and they folded, and they worked, and they're 40% different to any naturally occurring protein. And so to think that the AI and AGI has to only be able to do human task is already limiting. Like a search engine also can do much more than a librarian ever could, right? So in a similar way, I think AGI will be able to do things that no human can do and then also get some of those things done that humans can do. We are running out of time. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <everyone. laughs>